Hi there, Physically Debunked here, and today I'm going to be talking about the spookiest effect in all physics. Like most spooky things in physics, this effect comes from quantum theory, which, due to its weirdness, has attracted all sorts of crackpots and charlatans who make a living off mystical claims linking consciousness and spirituality to quantum jargon. This actually makes me quite sad because the real conceptual issues in the theory are far more interesting and mysterious than these pseudoscientific cons. What I'm going to be telling you about is a fact far stranger than fiction, what I think is the spookiest real phenomenon in physics, quantum non-locality. To truly grasp how bizarre quantum non-locality is, it's necessary to understand what locality means and its status in the history of physics. Locality means what you'd expect it to. Physics is local when an object is affected only by its immediate surroundings. When you cross a road, you only have to worry about the cars that are going to be passing through that road in your local vicinity. You don't need to worry about cars in Mumbai if you're trying to cross a road in London. Locality is vital if we want to model the world around us. If physics is local, then we can make accurate predictions about how a particular system will behave without having to worry about everything else in the universe. Interestingly, in Newtonian physics, the electric and gravitational forces are actually non-local. They affect objects instantaneously. In Newtonian physics, all celestial bodies exert their gravitational pull on us instantly. The reason we can ignore other galaxies when we calculate how much force it would take to stop a car is because gravity obeys an inverse square law, meaning the further away you are from an object, the weaker the force it exerts on you. Because distant galaxies are so far away, we can ignore their gravitational effects and just include the gravitational pull of the Earth, which is the celestial body in our immediate surroundings. If Newtonian gravity obeyed a different law, say one where the strength of the force didn't drop off with distance, then non-locality would be very obvious. Physics would no longer be able to make accurate predictions of how systems behaved without taking into account everything in the universe. Newton himself saw non-locality in his physics as a real issue. He was convinced that non-locality was a problem that needed solving, but he thought that the task of explaining gravity locally was beyond the tools of his time. It turns out he was right. It took another 300 years or so before Albert Einstein came along with his general theory of relativity and explained how gravity could be a local force. Objects feel the way that space-time curves in their immediate surroundings, and this is what we see as gravity. In the early 20th century then, it looked as though locality had been restored. Physics is local and objects only respond to things in their immediate surroundings. This would have been a happy end to the story. But now comes the plot twist. In the early 20th century, quantum mechanics had been developed, and now the academic luminaries of the time were fiercely debating what it meant. Einstein, who was one of the founders of the theory, was deeply distressed with how Niel Bohr and his followers were interpreting the theory. Einstein was convinced that quantum mechanics was incomplete, and that all the weird phenomena in it only seemed weird because the theory missed things out. Einstein thought that there were hidden variables which, if only we knew, would make sense of the quantum world. The next important chapter in this story is a paper published by Einstein in 1935, now known as the EPR paper. A modern version of the argument in this paper goes like this. Suppose you have a machine that spits out two electrons. When it spits them out, it fires them in opposite directions. In two faraway galaxies, Alice and Bob have detectors which they'll use to measure the spin of each electron when it arrives. Spin is a property that individual electrons have, and for our purposes all you need to know is that an electron either has spin up or spin down. The machine we're using prepares the electrons in a special quantum state, known as an entangled state, where it will always be the case that one electron is spin down and the other is spin up. We don't know which side the spin up particle will be, but it will always be the case that one spin up electron and one spin down electron will be produced. If we run this thought experiment, two electrons get generated and fired off to opposite galaxies. Eventually, an electron arrives at Alice. She uses her detector to measure its spin. She finds that it's spin up. When Bob uses the detector on the other electron, he'll find that it's spin down. 
But how did Bob's electron know it needed to be spinned down? Well, this seems like a silly question. Obviously, when the two electrons were created, one was spinned down and the other was spin up. We just didn't know which. Bob's electron was always in the spin down state. What Einstein argued, however, is that in quantum mechanics this is not the case. When the two electrons are created, quantum mechanics tells us that neither electron is spin up or spin down until they're measured. Let's run the thought experiment again. The machine generates two electrons in an entangled state. At this stage, neither electron is spin up or spin down. The electrons get fired out to Alice and Bob. Just before Alice measures the electron, it's still the case that neither electron is spin up or spin down. Then Alice detects her electron, and her detector says that the electron is spin up. In the faraway galaxy, Bob also measures his electron and finds it to be spin down. Now it's not a silly question to ask how Bob's electron knew it had to be spin down. The two electrons were light years apart when Alice's electron decided to be spin up. How could Bob's electron possibly have known it needed to be spin down? For it to have known, some instantaneous non-local interaction would have had to occur. Alice's electron instantly broadcasting to Bob's electron that it was spin up and that Bob's electron needed to be spin down. Einstein argued that this spooky action at a distance, this non-local interaction, can't be a part of physics. Since quantum theory is non-local, it can't be complete. Einstein argued that there must be some hidden variables which determine which electron is spin up and which one is spin down before they're fired off to opposite galaxies. It seemed that quantum mechanics couldn't be a fundamental theory. If we want to preserve locality in physics, then we have to abandon quantum theory and replace it with a local hidden variable theory. It looked like quantum mechanics was doomed. Or at least it did, until physicist John Bell proved a shocking theorem. Making some plausible assumptions, Bell derived an inequality, which must be satisfied by any local hidden variable theory. Bell then showed that this same equality was actually violated by quantum mechanics, which means that local hidden variables and quantum mechanics are incompatible. This is Bell's theorem, that local hidden variable theories cannot reproduce the predictions of quantum mechanics. There is no way to complete quantum theory by adding hidden variables that recovers locality. It's impossible. Einstein's dream of completing quantum mechanics with local hidden variables was dead. At this point though, all the arguments were theoretical. The big question remained, does nature violate the Bell inequalities and agree with quantum mechanics, or does it satisfy the inequalities and preserve locality? In 1982, Alain Aspect conducted an experiment to test this very question. The results were conclusive. Nature agrees with quantum mechanics. Nature violates the Bell inequalities. What does this mean? This means that the thought experiment I described earlier is real. Somehow entangled electrons can know when each one is measured and what spin state each one needs to be in. This is quantum non-locality and it's real. Somehow distant objects can interact with each other instantaneously. How can this be true? Doesn't this violate relativity, which says that nothing can travel faster than light? Or if physics is really non-local, then how come we can still predict things without taking into account everything in the universe? It turns out that this kind of non-locality is consistent with relativity. Although somehow objects can communicate with each other instantly, this can't be used to transmit information, and no energy or matter is being transmitted between the particles. Relativity prohibits information, matter or energy travelling faster than the speed of light, but this kind of non-locality doesn't involve these things. Also, didn't I say earlier that non-locality would spell the end of physics being able to predict things? This would be the case if non-local interactions dominated over local ones, but this doesn't seem to be the case. Our world, to a good approximation, can be considered local. All the important forces and interactions our local ones. This is good because we can still use our physics to model the world, but it raises an intriguing question. If non-locality is real, then how come locality is such a good approximation? And what would the nature be of non-local interactions? How would they work? Now, I also said that in the derivation of inequality, Bell makes several assumptions. 
since nature violates Bell's inequality, at least one of these has to be wrong. Locality is one assumption in the argument, but there are others too which perhaps we can drop to save locality. The key assumptions in Bell's derivation are locality, which we've already discussed, measurement independence, which says that how Alice and Bob choose to set up their measuring devices is independent of one another, they can choose them how they like, and the third assumption is unique experimental outcomes, which says that for each experiment or measurement done, there is just one result or outcome obtained. If we want to save locality, then we need to drop one of these other two assumptions. But which one could we drop? There are two ways that this could work. The first is known as retrocausality, which suggests that causation can occur both ways in time. The past affects the future as much as the future affects the past. If we allow causes to go backwards in time, then we can save locality. When Alice measures her electron and finds it in a particular spin state, the causal effect runs backwards in time, back to the machine that produced the two electrons. The causal effect then runs forward in time to Bob's electron, making sure it's measured in the opposite spin state as required. To us, it appears as if Bob finding his electron in a particular spin state is simultaneous with Alice measuring her electron. But actually, this is because cause and effect has run backwards in time to when the electrons were together, and then forward in time to Bob. This preserves locality. An alternative way this could work is imposingly known as superdeterminism, which suggests that there is some common cause in both Alice and Bob's past which determines how they set up their experiments. This doesn't sound too weird on the face of it, but let me explain. Let's imagine that there's a shop which sells individual gloves in boxes. In any particular box, there is either a left-handed glove or a right-handed one. On Tuesday, Alice goes into the shop and picks a box, buys it and takes it home. Now the shop is restocked, and then on Wednesday, Bob goes into the shop, he's never met Alice before, and picks his own box, buys it and takes it home. What superdeterminism suggests is that there is some common cause which necessitates that Alice and Bob will always pick boxes with opposite-handed gloves in. Somehow, the conditions of the universe mean that Alice and Bob can never both pick boxes with left-handed gloves in. They will always pick boxes with opposite gloves in. I hope it isn't just me who finds both of these alternatives to locality pretty spooky. The question we need to ask is whether it's worth keeping locality if instead we need to accept that retrocausality or superdeterminism are things. There is one more assumption that we can drop whilst preserving locality and avoiding retrocausality and superdeterminism. This is the assumption that for every measurement done, there is exactly one result. Now it seems obvious that for any experiment done, there can only be one result. How can we perform a single measurement and get multiple results? It turns out that this is possible if you accept the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, which says that for any quantum event, every possible outcome actually happens. In this way, whenever a quantum system is measured, all possible experimental outcomes occur. So for any particular measurement, there are multiple outcomes. To summarize, the fact of the matter is that Bell's inequality is violated in our world. Whether this means that physics is non-local is up for debate, but whatever it means, physics is faced with a spooky dilemma. There's no going back. Whatever happens, we're going to be forced to accept something utterly bizarre about our world. Maybe non-locality is real, and particles can somehow communicate with each other instantaneously. Perhaps there are many worlds out there where every possible measurement outcome is realized. Maybe retrocausality is real, and the future forges the past as much as the past forges the future. All of these possibilities are spooky, and yet one of them is real. Science fact is far stranger than fiction. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope you enjoyed. Please like and subscribe for more physics and philosophy and weird stuff.